something that may surprise you in light of the circles in which we travel, and that is the purpose of God in saving you and in saving me. Why did Christ die on the cross? Why, as the sinless sacrifice that he shed his precious blood here, why, with reference to salvation, was it so that you and I might escape the rigors of an eternal hell? Was it that we might have an assurance of heaven? Was it that we might have the privilege of a great fellowship here upon earth? Was it that we might become children of God? And name a number of other things which re are results of the great benefit of the sacrifice of Christ? Was that God's real purpose? Well, there are a number of facets to the great truth of the work of Christ at Calvary according to the plan of God. And one of those great purposes is expressed for us in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And I believe this to be the primary purpose of God in saving anyone upon the face of this earth. And I'm going to read now, beginning with verse 28, and you follow along if you will, please. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. I believe in verse 29 we have a key and a kernel, if you please, to the purpose of God in saving each one of us. But first of all, before we get into that major purpose of God, I would like for you to see that in verse 29 we have another purpose expressed in the last part of verse 29 with reference to the matter of saving us, and that is that He, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. The firstborn among many brethren. In other words, He is to be the one of uh, the primary order. He is to be that which is the head. Uh, everything which relates to the superior and the supremacy of the Lord Jesus is expressed right here that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now hold your hand here and turn with me to the book of Colossians where we read of at least two other great statements concerning Jesus Christ being the first begotten or the first in order. Colossians chapter 1, if you will, please. There are two things mentioned here, beginning with verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together or consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Now, in this particular portion of Scripture, we have that He is the firstborn of every creature. Now then, as we go a little bit farther, and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him, I say, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth, and you that were manifest and sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled 
by the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, here you have the great order and the great plan with reference to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But expressly stated in verse 18, he is the firstborn from the dead. Now, here are three statements concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the firstborn of the, from among the dead. He is the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, He is the first one. He is the one of preeminence. He is to be the one that all things revolve around, and particularly when it comes to the matter of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. In light of being saved and then the practice of that, He is the first one. Again, He's the firstborn among many brethren. He's the firstborn among all, all creation. He's the firstborn among uh, the dead. He is the first in order. Now, all things with reference to a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ must fall in line and a pattern with the one who is the first in order, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So that brings us to the great revelation that He is the preeminent one. Now back to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, where we begin to read the great purpose of God in saving you and in saving me in light of the fact that He is the preeminent one. For whom He, the Father, did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. The one who is the preeminent one, my heavenly Father, provided a salvation for you and provided a salvation for me that I might be conformed to Him. He is the firstborn among many brethren. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the firstborn of all creation. The purpose of God in saving you and saving me is that He might I might be, that is, conformed to His image. Now that is the great, great plan of God in saving us. But we ought to stop for just a little bit and mind some wonderful truths concerning this matter of being conformed to the image of the One who is the preeminent One. What does it mean to be conformed to His image? The Greek word is icon, and that word icon, it means to be the image, the very pattern, if you please, of a prototype, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I like to try to illustrate it this way, although all human illustrations break down when it comes to the matter of endeavoring to illustrate the person of the Lord Jesus and His great work. <coughs> All of us at one time or another have taken some pictures. Now then, when we take a picture, we have one negative. Now then, that one negative, from that one negative, we can make a number of prints. Isn't that right? But each print will be the express likeness or the express image of that negative. There's only one negative as far as that picture is concerned. One negative. And from that one negative, there is to be a number of prints, or can be a number of prints. But every one of those prints will give to us the explicit detail of that negative. Now then, that image, what do we understand by way of the image which he is the prototype? I used to think, with reference to my salvation, that I should take my pattern by way of my life, and I was to be conformed to the image of His Son after the person of the Lord Jesus, as is illustrated by virtue of a number of pictures. Solomon's head of Christ is a beautiful painting, to be sure. 
and sometimes we get our idea of the person of the Lord Jesus, whom we are to pattern our life after, from pictures or such a matter as this. Now, as beautiful as these pictures are, and as helpful as some of the illustrations by pictures may be for children, etc., that is not what we have by way of the image of the person of Christ. Let's go to our Bible and find out what is meant by virtue of the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back to Colossians chapter 1, if you will please, in the first chapter and in verse 15, where we have the pattern given to us. Verse 15, He who is the Lord Jesus, the image of the invisible God. All right, immediately I'm introduced now to the truth that the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, of which I am to be conformed to, the pattern, if you please, is something which is invisible. It is not that which is going to be physical, is not that which is going to be tangible, is not that which I can see by virtue of looking with the, with the human eye, but it is that which is the invisible nature, if you please, of God Himself. Because the Lord is the image of the invisible God. Now, you cannot take the image of an invisible God and make that image fleshly. cannot make that image tangible. So I immediately am told that as far as the pattern is concerned, I am to be conformed to a spiritual pattern. And that spiritual pattern is a pattern, if you please, of the Lord Jesus, who in turn is a spiritual pattern of the Heavenly Father. Now then, the Word of God confirms this in light of the original intent of our Heavenly Father. Turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Genesis, where we read the great intent of God when it comes to the matter of creation in uh, uh, creating man and woman, beginning with verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and etc. Down to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now then, in verse 26, in the beginning of verse 26, we have two things mentioned. We have the uh, purpose of God in light of creating man, and that is stated in this way. Let us make man in our image. Now, I'd like to suggest for you whether this is totally theologically correct or not, that we might be able to understand that by way of image, we have the characteristic the characteristic of God's intent concerning our creation. Now, when it comes to after our likeness, I'd like to suggest that this is the composition. Now, this may give us a little bit of help. The composition being likeness, that's spiritual. Now then, the image being of the characteristic deals with the attributes or the character, if you please, of deity or of God. Now, God said, let us, let us make man after our image in our likeness. Let us make man of with a characteristic like we are. Let us make man after a composition like we are, which is spiritual. This is confirmed, if you please, in Colossians chapter 1, where, the Lord, where it stated that the Lord Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So you and I, at this point, are dealing with something that is of an intangible nature. It is spiritual, but of a characteristic that relates to Almighty God. 
Now, I'm greatly encouraged when I come to verse 27, in this day in which we live, where it says, So God created man in his own image. Now watch it. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now, when it comes to the matter of the creation of the two genders, male and female, there's absolutely no distinction, is there? None whatsoever. They are both created by virtue of an equality when it comes to the matter of the characteristics of humanity. There isn't such a thing as we're finding today, this great so-called great liberation movement of the women's lib. Uh, that, that is, uh, that's diabolical. Nor is there such a thing as the macho man business. Now, God created man and God created female, male and female. Now, there is a perfectly God-ordained order for man and for woman. And that order is for the earthly function here below in light of the purpose of God expressed in verse 26 and also in the great creation story of the book of Genesis. There is a purpose for that. But when it comes to the matter of the spiritual relationship to God, when it comes to the matter of the spiritual characteristic of God, there is absolutely no distinction, absolutely none. And women, you are not second-rate humanity. And men, you are not superior humanity. We might like to think that's the case, but that is not so according to the Word of God. There is, again, let me state, a perfect order and a perfect function which gives to us the fact that man is head of his wife and his wife is to be in submission, but that's in light of their function as a man and as a woman here concerning their earthly walk. But when it comes to the matter of a relationship with God, you're on absolutely equal plane. And don't let anyone ever, ever, ever try to tell you contrary to that. No, sir. It's wrong, absolutely wrong. Now then, having looked at the original creation, listen, something happened. Something happened. Isn't that right? In the third chapter. And that is the fall of man. The great sin entering in to the human race broke that image smashed it, obliterated it by virtue of its purity before God. Man became a fallen image. Man became a fallen creature. That's man and woman. Therefore, in light of the great purpose of God, His purpose in sending the Lord Jesus, the superior purpose, I believe, is that you and I might be brought back to the conformity of the image of a heavenly Father by virtue of a spiritual relationship with a characteristic that He originally intended, whereby we could walk as Adam was supposed to walk in fellowship with Him. Now then, <coughs> the moment you and I are saved, God begins that process. He begins that process of conforming us to that great image. It's a process that begins from the point of salvation, and it will only be culminated when we meet the Lord, the great rapture of the church. All right, now then, let's prove that from the, from the Scriptures. Turn back with me, if you please, to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, where we once again read these wonderful truths uh, that we have just stated in light of this portion of Scripture. For whom he did foreknow. Now we are on the platform of omniscience. 
the all my, the all knowing God, for whom he foreknow, he did, he also did predestinate. Now here we are dealing with the omnipotence, the all powerfulness of Almighty God. Now the word predestina predestination is a word that has uh, come under a great deal of discussion and debate uh, among uh, uh, Bible-believing people and uh, those in the realm of theology have, liked, uh, have had a great deal of discussion and argument about it. But I'm interested in simply sharing with you the simplicity of the statement of predestination. And I believe that simplicity comes forth by virtue of definition. The Greek word is proharizo. Proharizo. Horizo simply means to mark out. Now then, the Greek preposition, which is a prefix to that verb, a pra, which means beforehand in light of time. In light of time. So here is a boundary, if you please, to be marked out beforehand. Now, we live in a particular area here in Canada that this can be uh, nicely illustrated. Right, to, uh, right in close proximity as we are situated tonight in this particular gathering, we have the Trans-Canada Highway 17 going right up north and so forth in, uh, and across the prairies. Now, a number of years ago, this highway had to be surveyed. In fact, we have had a man and his wife visit us right here and has been here in our chapel. He happens to be an elder in the ministry down uh, in the southern part of the province. And he was a conscientious objector during World War II. And he, along with a number of other men, were assigned to swamping out the roadway there above, uh, I understand, around Montreal River. Now, before that swamping could take place, they sent out a survey crew according to the engineering, according to the engineer's maps and so forth, that was determined beforehand where this road was to go. So they went beforehand and they marked it out. They put down certain pegs and uh, the uh, elevation and so forth. So when the heavy equipment came through, why well, they could build this great road according to the plan that had previously been designed in light of the mind of the engineers, and this road had prior marked out, staked out, if you please, that is predestination as to where this road was to go. Now that's the simplicity of predestination, and I don't think we need to go any further than that. So you begin to see the great process by which the purpose of God is to be fulfilled. The process follows a plan that was designed in the omniscience of God beforehand, before anything came into existence, before you were saved, before I was saved. Now then, he says, predestined to be conformed. Now here is the beginning of the understanding of the process, the same as there were specifications given concerning this road out here, conformed to the image of his son. What does it mean to be conformed? Now then, I want to give you this particular Greek word that you have in verse 29, and it's sum morphus, sum morphus. Now there are two words in relationship to this word conformed. There is the preposition soon, and then there is the word in its verb form, morpheo. 
sum morfeo. Now then, if I were to ask you what does it mean uh, when, when I state uh, this, what does metamorphosis mean to you? Well, you would just see, think back in a little bit of general science, and one of the classic illustrations that you would come up with is that here is a cocoon. And from that cocoon, there would come out a great butterfly, beautiful butterfly. So from that cocoon, there is something that, take, that takes place prior to it breaking open, but it takes place from within. Isn't that right? It takes place from within, and then at a given time, according to the laws of nature and so forth, out comes a beautiful butterfly. I like to illustrate it from a homey point of view in light of my own family right here in this ministry. As most of you know, we've got a barn out there where we have some stock, and there's a bunch of chickens running around. Now, one day uh, when Becky uh, was home and all three of our children were at home. Uh, she was just a little girl, and she came running into the house one day, and she said, Daddy, Daddy, guess what I have found? I said, Becky, what did you find? Well, up in the hay mow, where one of the braces come down, and there's a beam across there, there is an old hen sitting on a nest of eggs. And I said, Becky, don't disturb her. Just leave the old hen sitting on those eggs. But I said, look, you go back and you check that nest all the time. All right, now what was taking place? Day after day after day, she would go back and she would check that old hen out and though that nest of eggs. Now, for a number of days, all they were were eggs. Isn't that right? just eggs. They looked like eggs. Just looked like eggs. That's all she could say. Well, nothing happened out there. Just got a bunch of eggs out there under. But what was taking place? By virtue of the design of our Heavenly Father, there was, during this incubation period, there was something taking place inside that shell. And what was taking place, that shell, the inside the shell, a little chick was being formed from within, from within, from within. Then one day, all excited, here she came. Daddy, 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 guess what I found? Well, I, I, I knew what had taken place, but I said, okay, Becky, what, what, did, you, what did you find? Well, there's some just the cutest, fuzziest uh, little chicks out there. Listen, there, there was a miniature. There was a miniature form of the old hen. Isn't that right? Here, my heavenly Father designed beforehand that I would be conformed, conformed to a given pattern, the image of his son. But that confirmation now is the forming, if you please, from within, from within. One of these days, and we're going to look at it, something marvelous is going to take place. Now, our Heavenly Father has designed in light of revelation how the spiritual incubation period for every believer is to take place whereby we might be conformed to the image of the one who's to be supreme. He's to have first place. He's the firstborn. He's the first order. I want you to look with me at two particular passages. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Now, if you will, the book of Hebrews. And we'll come to chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Now in this great um, uh, 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, we learn of a father's direction for his children. Now I'm told that 
every son whom he receives, he chastens and scourges because he loves it. Beginning with verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he received. If ye do endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye illegitimate ones, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But now notice, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of what? His holiness. His holiness. Now, is that physical? Absolutely not. But do we have a holy God? We certainly do. Now, how is this performed for you and for me as being born again, those who are saved, those to be conformed to the image of His wonderful Son, Listen, folks, one of the greatest, greatest ways that my heavenly Father ministers for you and for me on a fatherly basis and a fatherly relationship is that He loves you and He loves me and He's going to correct us. He's going to chasten us and He's going to scourge us. What for? that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now notice verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now this has always caused me to have just a little bit of a smile. Those who are exercised exercise thereby. You see, this is one of the areas of spiritual calisthenics the Heavenly Father takes you and takes me to, and that is the chastisement coming from our wonderful Heavenly Father. What for? That we might be those that are being conformed to the pattern of His Son, that we might be partakers of His holiness, that we might also be bearing the great peaceable fruits of righteousness, righteousness. Here are just two, and there are many others that we could turn to, but here we might call it the negative approach of our God, and that is the, that is the plan and the process of being conformed to the image of His Son, the invisible, the spiritual image of holiness and righteousness. Folks, don't despise the chastening of your Lord. It is proof that you're loved of Him. It's just marvelous. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't chasten your children, you're not following. You're not following the scriptural pattern of loving them. It's a demonstration of love. You're jealous over them. And you want them to grow up right. You want them to partake of certain characteristics that are true for your family, for your household. My Heavenly Father does the same. But listen, it is in keeping with His great purpose that He designed beforehand in the outworking that I might now, as a believer, be conformed to, his, to the image of His Son. <coughs> if I am not exercised this way by the Heavenly Father, I'm an illegitimate person, and I have no relationship to God, and God is not going to be dealing with me. The only um, manner in which I am dealt with is by the evil one. But now listen, when I am chastened of Him, scourged of Him, it's proof that I'm being loved of Him and there is the building up of this process 
of holiness and righteousness from a practical point of view of being conformed to the image of His Son. Then there is another very, very important portion of Scripture, and I quoted it this morning, but I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to spend just a few moments at this point. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, concerning this great, great purpose of God in conforming us to the image of His Son. Now notice what it says in verse 18, but we all. None of us are left out. Not a one of us. Not a one of us. We all have the same privilege. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed unto what? The same image. The same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Can I just indicate for you that which the Greek is uh, so clear on that we all with unveiled face beholding as in a glass. And listen, this particular word by virtue of its basic stem occurs only three times. It occurs in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 that relates to a glass. It occurs in James chapter 1 which is an illustration of the word and light of a glass. Therefore, we can understand in this passage that we all with unveiled face beholding in the word of the Lord, beholding in the word of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. Now notice what it says. We are changed. We are transformed. Now what does our English say here? That particular Greek word is uh, the same as the one that you have in Romans chapter 8 with a different preposition prefixed to it. It's still uh, morpheo, but it's metamorpheo. Now then, it is what we call in the passive voice. That is, I do not do the work. Now I cooperate by beholding the Lord in the Word. I come to the Word. That's my responsibility, isn't it? But when I come to the Word, beholding a person in the Word, now listen, He goes to work. And that is, I am the recipient of being transformed. Transformed, changed from within unto the pattern of the purpose of God being conformed to the image of His Son. And that's what it says. We are changed unto what? The same image. We're transformed unto that pattern of the purpose of God in saving us, unto the image of the Son. And notice, it is a present tense verb which looks at a process that goes on and on and on. And may I say this to you? You and I have the privilege of determining in our lives to the degree that we want to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus. And that is what we're going to do with this book. Now listen, if you take the Word of God and you just leave it out of your life, you put it on the shelf day after day, you do not give the priority of the study of the Word of God. Listen, you're not going to be conformed to the image of His Son. You're going to be violating the purpose of God in saving you. And you're going to, as we're going to see in a little bit, you're going to answer for that. I'll tell you, young people, you couldn't get me not to make decisions to go on for the Lord. When I see what the Bible said, I don't care how good things may be in your life, you're robbing yourself of the purpose of God in transforming you under the image of His Son. And it's from one stage of glory unto the other state, another stage of glory. It is a process that continues and goes on. Now then, notice the agent. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. My, it's just wonderful, folks. I've got the Father's purpose. I've got the Son as the model. 
and I've got the Spirit of God who's the agent that does the internal work in my life. I've got the Trinity involved. And the Trinity's involved, if you please, in light of the Word of God. Rightfully handled rightfully handled the word of god is not going to make you a theological egotist rightfully handled the word of god is going to bring you into a walk that is going to reflect the purpose of god in saving you i don't know what you i don't know what price you're paying i don't know but whatever price you are paying it's too great absolutely so now then there is the process now let's look at the prospect which is before us and turn with me now to Philippians chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3 and here we have the prospect in light of the great great purpose of God in conforming us to the image of his son Philippians chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3 <clears throat> verse 20 and 21. You find it in your Bibles while I turn in my Greek New Testament because I want to share with you some things here that are found in this verse. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. For our citizenship. Now you please notice where we belong. For our citizenship is in heaven, in the heavenlies. Now it's from the heavenlies, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word look means to agar, eagerly anticipate. We eagerly anticipate the Savior, the Lord Jesus. Why? Who shall change? Who shall change our vile body? Now this particular Greek word here is metaschematizo. Now, schema looks at the external. Absolutely so. Now then, again, the meta, notice, looks at the change. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, and let me say something to you, that's our incubation time. That is when, if you please, you and I be conform, become totally conformed. But we are totally conformed by virtue of first a process that's beginning until the moment where the external is transformed, who shall transform our vile, weak body, that it may be, and this Greek word here, fashion, is exactly the same Greek word as you have in Romans chapter 8, conformed unto his glorious body, observe, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Folks, let's go back to our nest of eggs. For 21 days, there was a change taking place. And then that moment of great excitement for Becky with the sweet little chicks the shell broke. The shell broke. The shell was discarded. And the little chick, a perfect miniature of the old hen, then was to be cared for, nurtured by the old hen, so that the little one might grow and grow and grow. Listen, the illustration breaks down. But you and I, one of these days, the incubation period is going to be over with. And this old shell of ours, it's going to be set aside. It's going along with the internal. The two, then, are going to be conformed unto the image of his son. 
the purpose of God in saving you has become complete when He comes back. But listen. Listen. In that nest of eggs, there were some that didn't hatch. Some that didn't hatch. Do you know why they didn't hatch? Because they lacked the life principle. They lacked the life. The life which was true, to be true, from the chickens. That life to be transferred on. But those were just eggs. Those were just eggs. They had the same nest. They had the same fellowship. They had the same care. They had the same jealousy of the old hen. But what was taking place? For those.